Welcome. Welcome to RMIT and a special welcome to our honoured guest, Anya Schifrin from Columbia University. We are so grateful that she is with us again here at RMIT for her second official talk for journalism at RMIT, so we really appreciate that. Welcome to our adjunct professor of journalism, Maurice Schwartz, publisher of Blank, Black Ink and the Saturday paper, who will do a... Um, introduction for us in a moment, and our adjunct professor of communication, Andrew Jaspin, the director of the Global Academy. We have many prominent people in the audience, including our own professor, Lisa French, who is the dean of the School of Media and Communication, and my line manager, associate professor, Adrian Danks, the, who is the associate dean of media in our school. Dr. Philip Dearman, who is the program manager for journalism at RMIT, who is sadly leaving this job <laughs> at the end of this year. I'm not sure he's that sad about that. <laughs> um, distinguished members of the academy from across RMIT and other universities, and particularly our journalism staff at RMIT who have joined us here today. Working journalists, our very valued alumni, and current students, the next generation of journalists who we hope will go from here into reporting on some of the most important and factual stories of our time. Um, if you don't know very much about RMIT, we offer a Bachelor of Communications Journalism and for, pe and for people who have already done an under undergraduate degree in something else, we offer a one-year intensive graduate diploma of journalism. Graduates of these programs work for all major news outlets in Australia and around the world. Before I ask Professor Schwartz to formally introduce Anya, I would like to update you on the case of Dr. Shahadul Alam, who is our adjunct professor of photography here at RMIT. On the 5th of August this year, he was arrested in Bangladesh and faces 14 years in prison after giving a television interview criticising the Bangladesh government for its violent repression of popular student protests. The students were calling for safer roads in the wake of a, traffic, of a tragic bus accident. He photographed and live streamed the protests which saw more than 200 students injured by the police. He is a valued member of our academic community who has collaborated with Australian students and academics over many years. He has a global reputation as a champion of human rights. We have had some good news in the last few days that the High Court in Bangladesh has granted him bail. However, he has not yet been formally released and we are hoping for a resolution um, to his case in the coming days. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming here on this beautiful night to hear a really depressing lecture. <laughs> and um, to Professor Wake for the update about Shahidul, your colleague. I'll be sure to mention that when I get home um, to the, you know, talk to the committee, protect journalists, and, and keep apprised and make sure people at home know what's going on. Um, I think that what Professor Schwartz just did was draw a very clear line between the problems of media capture disinformation and attacks on um, journalism. And Andy Guest from Princeton said recently that the fake news disinformation thing has created a huge opportunity cost because I was a happy person working on global muckraking until Trump got elected. And then like everybody, I had to start thinking about disinformation. Um, and, and, and I decided that my little contribution would be to talk about the solutions. Um, again, it's a very depressing subject. Um, I'm glad that Alex mentioned Trump and truth because I'm totally fixated on Trump. Um, we all are now. We do feel that we're on the brink of fascism, that this is the end of the world. Uh, everybody I know has taken up drinking and gained 10 kilos and not sleeping anymore. We're completely focused on this topic. So I'll try, you know, sometimes I'll try to not talk about Trump for a couple minutes. But so basically what I have done is I've looked at all the solutions around the world that are being proposed. And I have divided them into sort of five buckets, and I have color-coded them for convenience. Um, and again, you're welcome to post this, this taxonomy on your, on your website. Um, so my sort of buckets are regulation of all kinds, good and bad, tech fixes, which we can talk about, efforts to promote media literacy, 
um, efforts to promote journalism quality. And I think maybe the fact checking that you're doing here would be part of that bucket. And then efforts to build trust in journalism. Um, and I've been so struck, we arrived last week, and I've been so struck by all the conversations here are so similar to the conversations we're having at home. Um, you know, the usual thing, as I started reading up on the subject, I discovered that really the whole problem of propaganda and disinformation is something people have been worrying about 100 years. And certainly after World War I and before the Nazi um, period in Germany, there, there was a huge debate about why do people fall for propaganda, right? Is it personal qualities themselves? Is it something to do with the medium? Is it journalism practice? You know, are some kinds of people more susceptible? And I discovered that um, actually Columbia University was home possibly to the first media literacy movement in the, in the world, or at least the one we know about. And it was founded by a journalist in 1937, and it was called the Institute for Propaganda Analysis. And a lot of what they do is what people are doing now, sort of making taxonomies of disinformation, talking about the different tactics that are used. Um, and they had a whole list, again, you can read this later, glittering generalities, name calls, Calling. Um, so that's, you can imagine in, in New York, everyone's really interested in this. Interestingly also, they started the first sort of, or not the first, but an anti-racism curriculum, which they launched in Springfield, Massachusetts. And then um, very sadly, the founder tangled with William, with Hearst, who was very anti-communist and um, Clyde Miller, the journalist who started this, got fired from Columbia University. And in the archives, all of you academics will be interested to know, I found letters from him to the president begging for his job and his apartment back. Because in New York, it's all about the real estate at Columbia <laughs> University. So more recently, there have been lots of attempts to promote journalism quality, which, which you know about. People have been worried about sensationalism for a really long time. You guys come from the country of Rupert Murdoch. Um, and so you know all about it. And I think that in the scholarship, what one point that keeps coming up over and over again is that the internet actually made things more complicated. So that audiences, which used to have sort of clear heuristic signals about what to trust, lost those. Um, with, with the advent of the internet. So it used to be, you know, if it was on the front page or it was in the New York Times, you, under, you understood what it was, and now people don't really know anymore. So that's one of, one of the points that's being um, made in the literature. After 2016, um, I felt like everybody in the world was starting a commission or a conference or a panel trying to think about what to do about disinformation. Um, so the EU, the Aspen Institute, Reporters Without Borders. So I'll just, I'll take you through um, the way I'm, I'm thinking about it. So what I decided, the first sort of distinction I make is that there are more or less supply side people and demand side people. So the supply siders are the people who feel like the problem is there's too much of this garbage out there. Um, we can really blame you know, Twitter, we can blame obviously Fox, we can blame Facebook. They're putting this stuff out, there's too much of it. The tech platforms are absolutely bare culpability. We don't have enough you know, regulation and there's this lack of accountability. I don't know how many of you all saw the latest news this week about Facebook and the, pub and the defenders. Yeah, so as soon as um, George Soros and others started talking about regulation in the United States, Facebook hired an opposition research firm of Republicans to start smearing the people that were promoting regulation. Um, they even went after, you know, Zuckerberg and Sandberg even went after people, some of those NGOs calling them anti-Semites. So it's been, we'll get to that later. Um, but they, they, they've reacted very badly to the idea of regulation. Um, and then a lack of quality news. So it's a supply side problem if we had better, better news. Um, we would have maybe less, you know, less, less of people not trusting media. And then on the d demand side, and we'll talk about those, are people who feel like, you know, brought, falling media standards, journalism practice has helped bred 
breed distrust, that weak news communication skills, that if audiences were more careful and thought more and didn't forward all this garbage, um, and if they had better education and better safeguards, we would have less of a problem. And obviously, depending on whether and who you believe is at fault affects what you think the solutions are. Uh, so if you're a supply sider, then obviously you want to see more regulation. And we can talk about some of the regulation that's being passed around the world. Uh, so censorship or suppression of information. So that's a lot of what Facebook is doing now and Twitter. They're trying to take down false accounts. They're trying to put disinformation lower down um, so that people don't see it. Truth and advertising, transparency and disclosure are one of the things that are being debated. More media pluralism, support for local news, and accountability for the platforms. So that, that's not side. The demand side would be much more what the position of the platforms is. So let's have more fact checking, let's have more media literacy, let's have more audience trust, and you know, community um, participation, and then some, some tech skills. And clearly, as Emily Bell has made the point, the Twitter and Facebook social media platforms would much rather blame journalists and the audience than blame themselves. So they have been promoting the media literacy and the fact checking because it lets them off the hook. And also because nobody wants to see regulation because regulation's too hard. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I do, I'm going to skip through it, is just take you through some of the big reports that have come out just in the last six months with all their recommendations. You don't have enough time to hear me go into details. Um, clearly, the scandals that have come out about Facebook just in, this year have renewed calls for regulation um, in the US. So Cambridge Analytica, I'm sure you remember. I sort of, I start this lecture from the assumption that everyone knows you know, what they've done. So I'm not, I'm not going into great details. And then, you know, literally three days ago, we found out about what Facebook was doing to hobble the opposition um, to, the, to what they're doing in their regulation. This, this um, slideshow has taken over my life completely. Like all I do now is update it because it changes every single week. And it's a bit, I don't know if you remember that Borges short story where they make the map that turns out to be bigger than the world. That's a little bit like this slideshow. You know, every single day I'm like, oh my God, something else has happened. Uh, so this is, so here are some of the big critics in the US. Maybe some of them have visited Australia, but we've got Barry Lynn who's talking about antitrust. Zainab Tufekshi who wants to completely sort of change the business model. Roger McNamee who wants more transparency and disclosure. And I think in the beginning, a lot of people thought disclosure might be the way to go, and now there's more of a feeling that we actually have to do further regulation. A whole lot of people from inside Facebook and Silicon Valley have now turned against um, Facebook and the social media platforms. The press coverage has been phenomenal because um, in New York, all the coverage of the social media platforms is so critical. So we have stories every day about how people at Apple and Facebook won't let their children have cell phones, won't let their children use iPads, are putting their kids in Montessori schools, right? So we're, we're getting, you know, how expensive the rents are in San Francisco, how bad Uber has been. So it's, we get a constant barrage um, of sort of reporting against the, the culture. And then so these people, Alex Stamos, he was the one who, is everyone familiar with him? So he was the head of security. He saw the Russian hacking on Facebook. He sounded the alarm, and he was basically pushed out by, um, by Facebook. So there have been people within the companies who've been descending and have been forced out. So these are, Tristan Harris is another one. So he's now devoted his life to warning people. So this is the thing. So in terms of regulation, um, one of the things that I'm you know, hopeful about, but I don't think it will happen, is at least sort of low hanging fruit. So one thing that Anne Ravel, the former Federal Election Commissioner, and others are pushing is at least disclosure of online political advertising. So in the last elections, you could put I don't, this may sound strange to all of you Australians, but um, because of the First Amendment, we have really no laws against hate speech, and we have no, uh, political advertising is protected under the First Amendment. So we may have, you know, truth and advertising regulations for a product do not actually apply to our political advertising. So you don't have to be truthful, and you don't have to disclose online where the advertising comes from. So to me, it's a very basic, 
idea that at least that needs to be disclosed. Um, so Mark Warner, Senator Warner, so there's a bipartisan bill called the Honest Ads Act, which is requiring um, some kind of disclosure, but Facebook is lobbying against that quite furiously. Seattle, we have a couple, 19, 19, Seattle actually passed their own law requiring disclosure. So they've been, they've been suing Facebook as well. Um, and again, when Mark Warner came out with this, uh, Facebook, it turned out our senator from New York, his daughter works at Facebook, so Facebook got our senator from New York to start calling up other senators and saying, stop it, drop, drop this. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, well, anyway, I won't say anything more because I know I'm being filmed. So, um, so anyway, these are some of the ideas about this. And, and it's a little bit similar to the problem of money laundering, that the, <clears throat> the banks have know your customers, so why doesn't Facebook have know your customers? They should have a list of everybody who's uh, taking out political ads. They should disclose that list upon demand. Um, and the problem, again, like with tax avoidance, is even if I say, well, I put a political ad on Facebook, if I secretly got the money from Australia, that wouldn't necessarily come out. Right? So, the, so there's limits to that form of regulation. And sadly, it's probably not even going to pass, um, even though there's, you know, a lot of people think it's a good idea. Uh, again, another area of regulation, which obviously the, the European Union has been working on, is the, the anti-competitive um, antitrust laws. Uh, so we've got people in the U.S. who really want to see some of the platforms broken up. But one of the perplexing um, things about fixing the sort of disinformation problem is that many of the solutions sort of contradict each other. So breaking up Facebook into a lot of small entities might not actually solve the disinformation problem. Um, and the other problem, of course, is that regulation can be misused. So when I was in Ecuador, you know, Ecuador under Correa passed all these laws which sounded great, like the right to reply. But what it meant was, you know, the mayor of Quito or whoever never responds when a journalist calls, waits till the article's out, and then says that was wrong. Give, you know, give me an article on the front page within 24 hours. So all of these things that sound really good can end up really being misused. And you saw that when Malaysia is no longer really enforcing the Anti-Fake News Act since the government changed, but uh, that law there disturbed a lot of people and you know, it brought in lots of criticism. Germany has now passed the, this um, online hate speech law. And that's quite interesting because previously people were personally liable for um, online hate speech and it was up to the states to prosecute. Now what's happened is the social media platforms have the liability and they can be fined if a pattern appears. Um, some people in Germany say this was just a way of sort of shoving off the problem. Um, there's been a lot of worry from the human rights and free speech groups that you know there'll be sort of overcorrection and preventive censorship. I don't think. I mean, the e at, at one point it looked like the European Union might try to do some of this, but as Maury pointed out, can't because of the governance problems in the EU. There's really no chance at this point. So we may see individual countries trying to copy this kind of law, um, but we're not going to see sort of EU-wide regulation. Uh, UK has also been looking at different forms of regulation. Again, this is all, I don't want to go into detail. And I, I, many of you probably know Brett Solomon. Isn't he our, um, Australian from Access Now? I think so. Anyway, he is very against. Many of the uh, NGOs in the United States that work on internet governance are, are very critical of any kind of regulation. Um, so I told Brett he could do his own slide. So he has written this saying, you know, any mechanism to review content it would involve some kind of surveillance and censorship and propaganda regime. Um, the problem, of course, is that the companies are already doing this. So you could, you know, one argument is let's at least get sort of government and the court system involved as opposed to just the big companies which are doing it now. Um, then another sort of whole bucket of, of fixes is all of the sort of hope that artificial intelligence will solve it, that we can, you know, train bots to identify bots, that we can just put on browser extensions, we can take things down sort of automatically. And I, th I think that's sort of a fantasy from, from what I understand. It's actually very difficult to make that work. It would be great if it did, but 
it's, it's unlikely. But Twitter will keep telling you how many fake you know, accounts are taking down, and, and Facebook as well. And I was talking to Julia Angwin last week who was just saying, you know, Facebook makes such a fuss about what they're doing, and you know, they have these war rooms, and they're really working on it, but the answer is they're actually not doing all that much, which, which, we, which, you know, which we see. Um, so I think I've just convinced you that the supply side solutions are really hard to implement. There are problems with pretty much all of them. Um, regulation is difficult. The sort of tech fixes often are ineffective. So what we're seeing is everybody's going for demand side solutions because they seem easier. So um, foundations are throwing money at media literacy and projects building uh, media trust. Journalists always believe that the solution to any problem is more journalism. So journalists are out there saying, you know, if only we have better quality. People won't watch Fox News if we can give them that good local coverage. Um, so, you know, and if we can just engage with our communities and, and build trust. So, Again, social media platforms love that because it takes away the responsibility from them. And it would be fantastic if, if these ideas worked. Um, I guess two points. One is the academic literature is very inconclusive on a lot of this stuff. And they're very hard to scale and they're expensive. Um, so we, we'll, we'll get into that. So labeling. Um, disinformation, giving people more choices, hoping that if you make more um, options available, people, people will go for it. Um, this f uh, fact checking, which you all know about because you do it here, is one idea. If you can sort of verify and hopefully make, um, promote more credible information and let people know when things aren't verified, maybe that, that will help. So, um, so we're you know, restoring trust in media. It's, it's an attempt to really restore trust in media. And, and I've got a few, again, we did a bunch of interviews last year with groups around the world trying to build media trust. So Kenya, um, Argentina. <clears throat> I think I was hearing today from Sushi that there's 130 groups around the world now doing fact checking. Is that what you said? Yeah. So um, don't know how much it will help, but certainly have to at least do that, right? It's part of creating a culture of truth uh, and remind you know and reminding people what's even though you don't like that word uh, again usually relies on foundation grants or probably universities uh, for support a, a new um, a new group has just opened in Brazil as well which is doing fact checking again Google News Facebook journalism project are helping st um, support some of this um, one of my favorites, although I don't know if it will work, but it would be great if it did, is we have a bipartisan effort in the U.S., which was founded by Gordon Krovitz, who was the publisher of the Wall Street Journal. He's a never Trump or Republican, and Steve Brill, who's a terrific, you know, Democratic um, investigative journalist. They've started something called NewsGuard, and they have they rate news brands red or green depending on um, three questions. Is it real journalism? Are they disclosing? Are they purveying fake news? And they're not charging the publishers to be rated, but they're hoping that you know, Twitter and Facebook will pay for it because they created the problem. So this is what, they're, what it looks like. Um, and again, it's part of, I know Gordon and I were talking about this today, the hope that if people are thinking properly and forming sort of reasonable judgments, they won't circulate all of this stuff, right? So this assumes. So the good thing about it is it's quick. You know, it's already gotten started. They're trying to spread to Europe. It doesn't rely on the government, which is nice for everybody, you know, who's worried about censorship. Um, the people involved are, are, have good reputations and they've got first mover advantage. Um, the question, of course, is, you know, how long is this going to last? Um, how long before, there are probably already people uh, in the world of disinformation who are starting their own fact-checking sites, and it could be easy to game, but, um, but that's, that's something, and I'll be spending the spring sort of looking at business and entrepreneurial solutions. Um, again, building media trust. The rationale is if we can sort of flood the zone with good content, people will, um, We'll start trusting the media again. Um, and part of that is building bridges with communities. Um, so this is very, spending time with audiences. And so there's a lot of groups around the world that are trying to do this right now. So Sweden, Germany, uh, Kentucky, uh, 
New Orleans, everything. I have a friend who runs focus groups at the New York Times, so she spends a lot of time with the millennials asking them, you know, what is it that you want? What are you interested in? I know the media outlets here are doing the same thing. Tell us your stories. Um, in the case of the New York Times, it's fun because it's made it very schizophrenic. So half the stories are sort of about, you know, retirement homes on the health page. And then there's all these stories for young people, like um, six things you should have in your apartment. And they'll say, like, scissors. Or um, it turns out that young people People don't know actually how to cook an entire meal and time it properly. So the New York Times is running articles about like how to make sure the potatoes are done at the same time as the chicken. So it's really fun to see both of those, you know, trying hard. And in Sydney, someone said to me, well, do young people actually pay for news? Because they're, they're not doing it in Australia. And I actually wrote to a friend at the Times and she said, no, no, they're still not paying for news yet. But, but, um, but anyway, so trying. So yeah, this, if you're interested more um, in the report that we did, this was a report that looked around the world on how, how people are trying to build trust. Um, so these are some of, the, some of the things, again, audience engagement, exposing people to quality news. You know, if we can just sort of label disinformation, it won't get, it won't get forwarded. And again, this is against a sort of terrible backdrop in the United States that we've lost a huge amount of local reporting. And so we keep thinking we can just get it back there. You know, if we can just get back the good coverage of the school boards and the police and, you know, the local government, uh, we will, will, will help. These are our news deserts, places now where we just don't have any sort of local reporting anymore. Um, and the one, so that's, uh, that's it. Um, so there's a whole bunch of now foundation funding on, lo on local news. Um, and again, I sort of go through that. You're probably doing the same kind of thing, listening posts. So these are all Bristol Cable in the UK. So that's another. And Emily Bell's point is, you know, it's a nice idea that we that better journalism will stop disinformation, but it conflates two crises. So obviously we need good journalism in any functioning democracy, but having more journalists will not be an antidote to the latter. Um, so again, news is, here's some of the news literacy projects as well, all around the world. Respect Words, which is a sort of EU um, thing on hate speech that's just got started. More journalism trust initiative. So, so every, everyone's trying. And you know, the problem is we don't know what's going to work. We were just talking about the, this morning. Um, given confirmation bias, given that people are circulating the stuff often, you know, your sort of average Trump supporter doesn't think that, um, you know, they, they don't care necessarily about the facts, right? They say, well, even if the fact isn't correct, he's speaking a larger truth. Um, and I think that because of the sort of decline in media trust, the decline in institutions, it's just not clear how much of this will work. I think we have to keep doing it, but it's, um, it's not clear. This was all really brought home to me about two weeks ago when my yoga teacher said to me, I'm drinking kale shakes. And I said, well, that's really nice. And she said, yes, they cure all diseases. And I said, really? Where did you hear that? And she said, YouTube. And I know it's no help whatsoever to argue in lecture. I mean, I, I understand that, but I couldn't resist. So I gave her this whole lecture about, you know, the enlightenment and scientific method and research and randomized control trials. And at the end, she said to me, well, you know, I guess everyone can just decide for themselves. Right? And that, that's what we're coming across more and more, right? And I've, it's almost at the point now where when someone says to me, I think for myself, I think, oh, that means you believe in conspiracy theories. Because what it means is that people are going on YouTube and believing, like, just seeing whatever garbage. And again, I had an argument with a cab driver the other day, and I said, well, how do you know what to believe? And this took a long time. And he finally said, I go online. And if I see something that fits with what I already thought, that's what I believe. So confirmation bias is obviously one of the things that, that, that we're worried about. And then the other point is there's a fair bit of political science literature um, on, on trust. And everyone believes what they personally look at, but it doesn't mean it's sort of specific and diffuse. So just because you believe that one journey, just because, you know, let's imagine some great building trust project sort of gets people to believe in their local journalist or their local outlet, it doesn't actually mean they're going to trust journalism or institutions more generally. So, um, so it may not be about the facts, right? It may be about something else. Um, so 
I think we're in trouble. I think we're, you know, we're definitely in trouble. Um, and it's related to trust in institutions. It's related to, you know, economic difficulties. Um, we've got a kind of huge, huge problem on our hands, and I'm, and I'm not sure how we're going to fix it. Um, again, I can talk about Trump for the next two hours. I'm right now reading Yochai Benkler's new book, um, which is really interesting. And he analyzed with his colleagues at MIT three million stories, um, two million before in, during the elections and one million after, the other way around, and found that um, disinformation was being deliberately pushed online. And his view is that it wasn't just the Russians, it was also the Republican Party. Um, so we're in a situation in the US where there is a tremendous amount of ill will, it's deliberate, it's not symmetrical, the left is not circulating disinformation and propaganda and lies with um, the way that the Republicans are, and they're not, um, they're not only not creating them, but they're not circulating them as quickly. So the sort of mapping is actually pretty terrifying because we can see stuff spreading from you know, the 4chans and the reddits and the sort of extreme websites into uh, the mainstream uh, legacy media, and of course, you all know, because you all know you, Rupert Murdoch, you all know that um, the Ec American Economic Review published last year the definitive paper on the presence of Fox means a three to four percent swing in favor of the Republicans. So we're really looking at a very, very toxic um, and poisonous media ecosystem at, at this point. Um, and I don't actually know how we're, how we're going to get out of it. One of Yochai Benkler's arguments is that legacy media's traditions of balance and scoops means that they're very, very vulnerable. So the um, alt-right was extremely effective in framing the Hillary Clinton story as a corruption story. And the legacy media felt they had to report that. Um, and so essentially, he says, you know, they were, pre they were pretty much hacked. And when you, when you analyze the coverage during the election, the coverage of Trump was about his, his ideas, and the coverage about Clinton turned into a corruption story. So um, media persuasion, obviously hard, hard to trace, but um, Trump won by small margins in many places. So we can't rule out that the micro-targeting and, and the sort of toxic disinformation and lies that were spreading may have had an, it had an impact. So we're all pretty terrified, very angry, um, and not quite sure, as you can see, how to fix this problem. So, thank you. So, Anya's kindly agreed to take some questions. The beautiful and wonderful Aaron, who has helped all day setting up chairs, doing all sorts of things, directing people here, has got a microphone. So if anyone's got a question for Anya, there's one. But you have to wait for this because it's being filmed. Thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, I'm from the uh, UK. I'm not Australian. And um, so my question is related to the UK. Um, have you uh, read the report of the Leveson inquiry? Um, and uh, so just two, two questions. One is, um, are you aware of any self-regulatory systems that are actually effective globally? Because the Leveson report basically said that the UK was, was broken and had been captured by the, by the major newspapers. And um, given that most of those kind of crimes were committed by the legacy media, do you think sometimes the comparison between new media and legacy media is overblown? Um, what do you mean by the comparison? So just in terms of their behavior, the idea that in the, you know, previously before social media and the internet came along, there was a, a group of incredibly principled journalists okay. not going through people's bins. <laughs> uh, I think, no, I don't. <laughs> I, agree, I agree with you, clearly. Um, and I, I don't know that, um, no, we obviously, and even if it were true, we, we're not getting back to it. So it's almost water, water under the bridge at this point. Um, I remember right after all this stuff happened, having lunch with Elliot Schrag, who was head of public policy at Facebook. And he sort of took a cavalier attitude and said, well, you know what, it's going to get to the point where there's um, so much, I don't know what, I can't remember what word he said, but he said, you know, sort of sensible people will end up being able to filter out 
all the, all, the, all the dreck, as we would say in New York, and we're gonna end up having a reasonable middle making decisions. Um, I think that's a, sort of da a dangerous view to take. Um, but I, but we're clearly not going back to, to where it was. Self-regulation, I don't know. I have no idea. Do you, do you have any experience with that? It's a nice idea. Uh, no, so when I was uh, working yeah. for the UK Parliament, I looked at, we looked at the, med uh, yeah. the uh, relationship between media ownership, mm -hmm. um, particularly high concentrations of media ownership, mm -hmm. and there was basically a direct correlation between uh, a market like the UK that was pretty much dominated by mm -hmm. two or three major players and the self-regulator being captured, whereas when you've got a very diverse yeah. kind of media ecosystem, self-regulation can work more effectively. Yeah, so I think we always thought that it was about diversity, but of course now we've learned, and so the internet seemed like a great idea in the beginning, right? It would lower barriers to entry, we would get more diversity, we would have better, more competition would lead to better quality, but I think no one realized that the financial problems that would hit and would end up meaning a race to the bottom. So um, I'm actually going tomorrow to Berlin for a conference on media capture. So we're going to be looking at different examples around the world of, su of support for media. But um, I think the lesson of a lot of this is huge amounts of competition doesn't necessarily breed um, better, you know, better quality. And I think the other lesson that we've learned, and this is really something we've learned since Trump came in, is that all of these systems depend on good faith. Right? and depend on a culture. Um, and if you have actors that are trying to manipulate or do harm, no matter how good the laws or the customs seem, they can, they can be abused. And I think that's really what we're seeing right now, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. That was really, really good. Um, um, my question, I guess, is how much do you think that uh, fake news and the spread of hate, yeah. uh, the hate speech, actually contribute to Donald Trump's election, actually? Uh, and how much do you think that is influencing the world? I'm from Brazil, and that, that's why my question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we just saw last month uh, the election of um, a fan of... Donald Trump, yep. uh, and his campaign, Jair Bolsonaro, the new president of Brazil, his campaign was online only. He wouldn't go to any TV debates or, yeah. um, and he is just following everything that John, uh, Donald Trump mm. uh, has done in his campaign. And yeah, so I'd like to, to, to know from you, what do you think about that influence, that spread of fake news and what it, it's, it's doing? To, to the world. So um, clearly our president is setting a terrible example for the whole world, right? So everybody now thinks it's fine to put a journalist in jail, beat up a journalist. They know that the US is not going to stand up against them anymore. So I, we have to take a huge amount of blame for that. Um, in terms of the influence of disinformation online, we don't have data. Um, and one of the problems, actually, is that Facebook won't share data that would be extremely helpful for us. So you could, in theory, look at what, you know, what researchers have done with Fox, right, which is you look at voting records and then you compare it to the micro-targeting. And Facebook won't release any of it. Um, no, they, they won't. And um, they, earlier this year, announced a plan with the Social Science Research Council. It's being funded by Hewlett and Sloan Foundation to start releasing some limited amounts of data to researchers. And when they put out the call, they said, we will not release data to anybody who wants to study what happened in 2016. I know, amazing. And for all of us, it's really, it's like getting to the end of the Agatha Christie novel and not knowing who did it, right? Like, all of us have been watching for two years and we want to know what effect it had and, and they won't give us the data. So, um, so we don't know. The, you know how sort of uh, 
spotty the media persuasion literature is. You're all, you know, many of your academics who've looked at it. Um, so I, I don't think we're, we're going to know. But we can cert and that's part of why it makes regulation hard. Because if it turns out it's not a problem, we don't want to sort of throw out the First Amendment and freedom of speech. Even if it is a problem, we don't want to throw out the First Amendment and freedom of speech. Uh, but I would, so I would say alarming, very alarming. And certainly not good, even if we don't know what it did to voting, it's not helping the world. Right? The world is, it's ugly, it's mean, it's bad. It's really bad right now. Yeah. Thanks, Anya. I wondered, I have two questions. Please. One, uh, I was wondering if you think there's going to be a point where digital media will not be as popular as it is mm -hmm. at the moment. Because in, in the Edelman Trust Barometer, if you're familiar with that, and some of you, I think I shared this with Alex, that yeah. in that report, um, two years ago, peer platforms were mo most trust yeah. trusted. But now, institutions, as you said, including the media, have declined in trust. Yeah. But in the media component, it was the social media platforms that were least trusted yeah. compared to the journalists. In fact, right. they suggest that yeah. journalists are gaining more credibility now yeah. than That's they used to be. So do you think that at some point there's going to be some maturity and you know, hopeful and be yeah. hopeful about. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. In a sort of perverse, crazy way, a lot of this has been great for journalism. Um, I just finished uh, with my students interviewing media startups from the Global South who we had interviewed in 2015. And we went back to them in 2018 to see how they're doing. And many people across the world told us that there's more support for them, there's more interest for them, their work is more appreciated. Sadly, it's not translating to more funding. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at the New York Times, huge comeback. I think they have something like 2 million digital subscribers now since Trump. 2.6, thank you. And many of those people are paying. So yes, absolutely, absolutely, I do think that. And thank you for telling me something cheerful or reminding me of something cheerful. Definitely. We need it, we need it. Yes, in the back. Mm. Hi, Anya. Thanks again. Um, a thousand things I'd like to ask and contribute to that, but I'll, I'll try and keep it to just one or two. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that the Trumpian message is designed to appeal to grievance, right, to mm -hmm. people with grievance. Now, after the election, when Trump was elected, voted in, a lot of the small L liberal, mainstream liberal um, media had a real existential crisis about how they went about doing their journalism and decided they hadn't been reporting the stories yep. of people across the country who had grievance and they yep. felt that their, their grievances weren't being yep. um, um, attended to. One of the roles of journalism mm. is to bring to the attention of politicians and other public figures the grievances of people, the issues that people face so that they can be right. dealt with by politicians. Mm -hmm. If the media starts to do that more thoroughly in a, in a more effective way yeah. and helped allay some of those grievances, perhaps the messages of the, of the Trumps of the world wouldn't be as appealing. What do you think? Um, wow, I think about, there's a lot of things I think. One, have you read Jay Hamilton's book, Democracy Detectives? Mm -hmm. That's the first cost-benefit analysis of local investigative reporting in the United States. And um, what he found was precisely that journalists were able to affect change enormously through their reporting. Again, you've seen the, the news desert charts. There's no funding for that now. So, so that's one thought. Um, second point is I was recently reviewing the political science literature on coverage of corruption. And as you know, there's a lot of question about whether more coverage actually motivates people and inspires them or whether it just depresses them. So, so there's, that, there's that question too. Um, if every, you know, if people start reading more stuff about how terrible their local government is, you know, will it, will it actually help? And then the third point, I guess, is the limits to journalism, which is we have in, you know, our red states that supported Trump, we have collapse in wages, collapse in health, declining life expectancy. So will a few stories in the local paper address that? I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. These are huge structural problems, and I guess there's limits to what journalism can do. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Doesn't mean we shouldn't push for that. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sounding like a real academic. Like, sorry, I don't have data. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. A couple more questions. And then... Hi there. Yeah. Um, do you think that these issues can be addressed by education at the primary and secondary level about 
uh, rational thinking stuff like, as you say, confirmation bias and, you know, motivated cognition and that sort of thing, probabilistic. I think it's reasoning. important to do it, but I also think it, we don't know how effective it is and also um, it's going to take a long time. But yeah, I think clearly the, you know, the education problem in the United States is a, is a tremendous problem, right? The lack of knowledge. But there's lots of places with more educated population that are still turning to alt-right. And I, you know, I thought what Maury's point about migration was really, really important. That's becoming a scapegoat. Um, we recently met with someone running for state office in North Carolina. This tiny races, their local Republicans were running ads saying the migrant caravan is full of Haitians and Mexicans coming to vote illegally in our election. Like, yeah, you know, I doubt they would even be able to find that place on the map, but they're able to scare, you know, scare people and whip up, whip up fury. So I think when you're appealing to those kind of really base base instinct, hopefully education will help. Again, got to do all of these things, just don't know, you know what's going to work. I think we had one more question. I don't want to take up everyone's evening on this gorgeous day, but I can stick around and talk also Thank individually. You. Thank Sorry. you. Uh, hello, Professor. I come from China. I'm Jade. I'm kind of writer, but my article in China always banned by government if I wrote something about democracy, human rights, yeah. women's rights. I was shocked because when in China I think America is a democratic country, not happen something like this. But today I see even in America now have a censor, right? Censor on Facebook. Why it happened? It totally shocked me because China, just like George Orwell, 1984, mm. they are very to censor everything. But why it happened in Western country? It's totally uh, my my heart a little break. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, and also there has a TV series called The Newsroom. Have you watched it? I've heard it's wonderful. I really I've love this recommended. newsroom. Oh, thank you. So that means uh, to protect freedom of speech, not just uh, democracy can protect. Also, it, uh, it also happened uh, to catch the generals. It also happened in Western country. So how can we to resolve this problem to protect the human of speech, free, uh, freedom of Free speech? speech yeah. so it's not... Uh, oh, some, I'm really excited. Okay. Because when in China, I think maybe if China become a democratic country, I can just I can to write, mm -hmm. I can speak. So I always fight for democracy. Yes, mm -hmm. I write article about. Uh, but today I come here. So what happened? Why the the power can override the law? So I think that the mechanisms of surveillance and censorship are actually quite different in China mm -hmm. and the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I. I, I think you could think about those differences oh, as well. You. I don't want to say our system is like China's system, um, but I think that one thing that we've got now, and I think you know Emily Bell and others have talked about this, is there's sort of a crowding out of information, and that's one of the ways that, that voices are drowned. So it's not a stopping it from appearing necessarily, it's a sort of crowding out. And I think that's why a lot of people refer to the sort of disinformation problem as a sort of contag you know, a contagion problem. So I'd like to say that. So I think I've probably taken up enough of your time. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and I guess, uh, the, I guess my, the last thing I wanted to say is I'm always, as you can tell, adding. So if there's anything you want to add, email me. I'd love to do a page on your fact-checking initiative here. I don't have enough on fact-checking. If there's a big mistake, email me. Um, and again, I'm really happy I've done like a lot of uh, reading and literature reviews. So if you want more information about any of this, I've got hundreds of citations that I'm really happy to share. So thank you for your time. Thank you.